Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast. Today, I'm highlighting the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon, which is back every Monday with our second season. And it's the first ever snackable Old Time Radio podcast, serving up clips and sketches from longer form Old Time Radio programs or self-contained shorter programs. Episodes range from performances from well-known stars to those who've really gone into obscurity and historical oddities. Whatever it is, you're going to get a treat on the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon. That's at snackwagon.net or wherever you get your podcast. Well, now it is time to get into this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. And we will be playing episodes one and two of the serial today. If you are of the mind to listen to all five episodes at the same time, then I would encourage you to pause the podcast now and then come back on Friday to play the rest of the episode. But now, from October 1st and October 2nd, 1956, here is The Picture Postcard Matter, Episodes 1 and 2. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. How are you doing? Lousy. Right now, I've got one big headache. A $100,000 headache. Try an ice bag and go back to bed. A bag of ice would cure me, all right, but not the kind of ice you're thinking of. Hmm? A hundred thousand bucks worth of uncut diamonds, Johnny. They've been stolen, and we wrote the policy on them. hundred thousand? That's a fat lot of rocks, Tom. And a fat fee if you can recover them for us. You interested? Oh, that's the understatement of the week. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the picture postcard matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and a quarter. Taxi to the office of Global Casualty, where Tom Wilkins was waiting for me. Well, looks like we're bucking a pretty well-organized outfit in this deal, Johnny. The way they pulled the job shows they'd planned it out pretty well. How did it happen, Tom, and where? The diamonds were being taken by special courier from Zurich, Switzerland to Amsterdam. They got lifted at the Zurich airport. How? The airport was crowded. The courier was carrying the diamonds in a leather briefcase strapped to his wrist. A fight broke out suddenly. In the confusion, the courier was slugged and the case cut loose from him. After which the fight suddenly stopped, huh? Yeah. It was obviously a rigged brawl. By the time the police arrived, the people involved had disappeared. With the uncut diamonds. Mm -hmm. Sounds like their timing was pretty good. Too good. How about the courier? He got a look at the guy who slugged him? No, it happened from behind. Anybody in the airport crowd able to describe the guys who'd rigged the brawl? Well, no clear description. Somebody mentioned that one of the men involved was stocky, sort of a bull neck. Oh, great. Probably only a couple of million people answering that description. True. Zurich police turn up anything? Not a thing. Well, look, Tom, I'm an insurance investigator, not a magician. You better get yourself another boy. Whoa, Johnny. We got one lead, and it could be enough if it's on the level. Oh, well, let's have it. The robbery was day before yesterday. This morning, I got an airmail special delivery letter from Zurich. Here, take a look. Uh -huh. Regarding the recent diamond matter, I have information which may enable you to recover them. For a reward. So I see. And he wants to talk to somebody about it. Yeah, and I nominate you. It's signed Sebastian. 
Any idea who he is? None at all. As you see, I was to reply to General Delivery in Zurich. I did. Told him you were the one. Uh Uh-huh. How do I find him? Well, read on. You're to register at the Polo Hotel in Zurich. He or she will contact you there. You think it's on the level? I don't know. Could be a phony. Somebody trying to ace in and promote a fast buck. It's happened before. Sure, and this could be another one. But right now, it's the only lead we've got. We've got to take a chance and go along with it. I can't say I care for the postscript here. Extreme caution necessary. Leads me to think there's one thing you'd better be real sure about, Johnny. What's that? That you don't get contacted by the wrong guy. And so, with the sun sinking slowly in the west and my morale slowly following suit, I said goodbye to my cheerful friend and set sail for distant shores. Item two, $622, plane fare and incidentals to Zurich, Switzerland. It was a quiet, uneventful flight, and I had a lot of time to think. But I didn't much like what I was thinking. Whoever had lifted the uncut stones wouldn't exactly like the idea of an informant spilling the beans to me... And I had a slight hunch I'd be lucky if beans were the only thing that got spilled. My plane landed at Zurich in the late afternoon. I hired a cab, that's item three, one dollar, to take me to the Polo Hotel. The city looked bright, fresh, and clean. It gave me a lift. And the sight of a very pretty girl walking quickly to my cab as we were ready to pull away from the airport didn't hurt either. Oh, darling, I... Well, oh. hello. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I've made a mistake. Darn it. I thought you but were... That was somebody else. Yeah, that's the trouble with having an ordinary-looking face. Well, I wouldn't call it ordinary. But, but please... Well? Please, I, I wonder, could I share your cab into the city? Oh, by all means. I guess my friend was not on that plane after all. Oh, that's rough. Okay, driver. Oh, this is very good of you. Well, I'm a real prince when you get to know me, Miss... Schaefer. Ilsa Schaefer. Johnny Dollar. And speaking of getting to know me... Driver, please, pull up. Well, hey, how come? Oh, I am so sorry, Mr. Dollar. I just remembered something I have to do. We were just beginning to get acquainted. I know. A pity, isn't it? Well, look, wait, don't... But perhaps this will make up for it. Well, offhand, I can't think of a better start. Now, if you'll only... Goodbye. Hey, Ilsa, wait. Hmm. Well, if this is the customary Swiss hospitality driver, sign me up. Then I realized that Ilsa had forgotten her purse. I had the driver cruise around a few minutes, but we didn't see her anywhere. So I dropped her purse off at the lost and found office of the taxi cab company, then went on to the Polo Hotel. It was in the newer quarter of Zurich, on the lower slopes of the Zurichburg. I went inside and started for the desk in the lobby, but I didn't quite make it. Turn here, please. Sorry, I'm heading for the desk. I said turn here, please. You know, I can't say I care for the way you keep nudging me in the ribs. That wouldn't be a gun, would it? Yes, it would. Now, if you will, please come with me. Okay, mister. Where to? To the side entrance. I'll say one thing. I sure didn't expect all the reception committees. The first one I like much better. Huh? Skip it, will you? Outside. That car over there. Hey, look, isn't it about time you tell me what this is all about? There's no use pretending you do not know. The diamonds. Oh. You think I've got them, maybe? I do not think. I'm sure of it. Well, this may come as a nasty surprise to you, mister, but I... I have no time to waste. She entered your cab with a purse. She? And... Ilsa? And left without it. And she was, uh, shall we say, very friendly to you. Oh, that I remember. And I have no complaints, believe me, but she didn't give me any diamonds. I warn you. They weren't in her purse, either. They checked the contents at Lost and Found. Get into the car. Hey, look, this routine won't get you anywhere. Into the car. Hey, take it easy, friend. You're trying to poke a hole in my ribs. Okay, okay, relax. Take it into the car. I jerked the door open suddenly to knock him off balance. I swung at him, but he ducked and lunged at me. I went sprawling into the street in front of an oncoming car. The fenders hit me a glancing blow and I bounced against the curb. By the time I could get to my feet again, my friend with a gun had disappeared and so had his car. I wasn't hurt, but it took several minutes to convince the very scared cab driver who'd accidentally hit me. He should be scared. Expense account item four, twelve dollars and seventy-five cents. Telephone call to Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty Bank in the States. 
Well, I'm glad you called, Johnny. Uh, any luck so far? No luck, but sure a lot of action. Well, what do you mean? Well, first off, an attractive little doll shares my cab for a few blocks, plants a kiss on me, and scrambles out, leaving her purse behind. What? Then a strong arm collars me and tells me the girl must have passed the diamonds to me in the cab. Oh, but that doesn't make sense. Well, anyway, that's what happened so far. Plus, my almost getting run over in the process. Look. Johnny, I knew this wouldn't be an easy assignment, but... Uh... Yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't worry, Tom. I'm still all in one piece. But I'm beginning to realize what Sebastian meant in his letter about extreme caution being necessary. Has anyone contacted you yet? No, only the aforementioned pair. No sign of this Sebastian, whoever he or she is. Well, I still don't understand Neither why... Neither do I. Either the boys who stole the diamonds have lost them, or there's another outfit trying to get their hands on them. In which case, I'm right in the middle. Johnny, Sebastian's still our only lead. You've got to give him plenty of chance to contact you. Yeah, I know. we Will do. But be careful. Look, I'm with you, believe me. I went up to my room and stretched out on the bed to wait. Two hours went by. Nothing happened. Finally, I went down to the lobby. Expense account item 5, 30 cents, two English language newspapers. I settled down in the most conspicuous chair I could find and waited some more. Still nothing. I worked my way through the newspaper slowly. Then, finally, somebody came over to the chair that was back to back with mine. I took a quick look. He was well-dressed, dark wavy hair, medium height. But he paid no attention to me and started reading his newspaper. Looked like a wrong guess. Maybe I'd have to wait until tomorrow. So I started to get up. Mr. Dollar. Mm, what? Please. Put your newspaper in front of your face and do not turn around. Okay. Who are you? Sebastian, who wrote the letter to your company in the United States. Oh? It must not appear we are talking to each other. Somebody watching us? I would not doubt it. So you want to talk about the robbery of those uncut diamonds? How do I know you have any real information? I will give you proof presently. But first, let us talk about the reward. What is the amount? Depends on how good the information is, Sebastian. I am talking about the diamonds. Oh? Suppose I were to tell you that I was in a position to guarantee their return. Go on. For $25,000 and no further investigation, I will arrange for the return of the diamonds. I'd have to have proof that you know what you're talking about. Of course. Let me see. My back is to you. Is it your right hand which is closest to the wall and shielded from the lobby? Yeah. Put it down beside your chair. Do not take the newspaper away from your face. Okay. Here. A picture postcard. Yes. Addressed to me, as you see. The writing's in German. What does it mean? It is the equivalent of your American expression, having wonderful time, wish you were here. Signed by F. Gruner. Who's he or she? A friend. Look at the picture on the other side. The Kleibach Inn? Yes. An inn in the town of Kleibach in the Alps, several hours from here. Hey, wait a minute. Are the diamonds at the Kleibach Inn? No. But this postcard is part of the key to their location. Part of the key? Oh, now look, Sebastian. This just isn't good enough. Shh, I can't... Shh. Someone is coming. I cannot talk further with you here. It is not safe. Oh, look, Do not you? worry. I will furnish all the proof you need. When? Tonight. Now listen carefully. I am going. I will leave my newspaper on the floor beside my chair. Wait a few minutes, then get up. Drop your paper, and when you pick it up, pick up mine also. Then what? On an inner page of my paper, I have written my address. Come there in two hours. If I am not there, wait for me. Now, just a minute. How can I... Please. There is no time for further questions. Two hours, Mr. Dollar, in my room. Two hours later, I went to the address he'd given me. A small apartment in another part of the city. No answer. He hadn't arrived yet. I went inside and waited. Fifteen minutes went by. No sign of Sebastian. And then something started picking away at my brain, a faint sound. I finally pegged it, a dripping faucet. It came from the bathroom. The bathtub was full. 
In it, floating face down, was Sebastian. Johnny Dollar. Inspector Herniger of the Zurich Police, Herr Dollar. Oh, yeah, Inspector. I talked to one of your men last night. Yeah, when you report the murder of this man called Sebastian. Yeah, any line on this killer? Not as yet. We are somewhat at a loss as to motive. That I think I can supply. So? Sebastian apparently had information about the robbery of some uncut diamonds here in Zurich. So? Yeah, and he was willing to sell his information. But somebody called off the sale permanently. So find the man who lifted the stones and we'll have Sebastian's killer. Perhaps. You don't sound convinced. It appears quite possible, Herr Dollar, that Sebastian was killed by a woman. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Zurich, Switzerland. Expense account continued. Mm-hmm. Item six, one dollar even. Cab fare from the Polo Hotel to police headquarters. Inspector Herniger was a big man who moved and talked slowly. But one look at his very cold, slate gray eyes told you his brain was moving a lot faster. Here, Dollar, I believe you told my lieutenant last evening that you were an insurance investigator. That's right, Inspector. And that you are in Zurich to investigate loss of a hundred thousand American dollars in diamonds at the airport a few days ago. Right. Well, uh, perhaps you had better supply me with such background as you may have. Gladly. The robbery itself, of course, you know about. A fight broke out at the airport. We know that it was, as you say, rigged. To create confusion. Yeah, and in the confusion, the courier who was carrying the stones was slugged. His briefcase was cut away from his wrist. Whereupon the assailants quickly melted away into the crowd. The exactness of their timing suggests that they were well organized and had planned the robbery in some detail. The next day, the company I'm representing got a letter from this man, Sebastian. He claimed to have information on the robbery and would help us recover the stones for a price. And you were sent to contact this Sebastian? Yeah. Or rather, I was sent here so that Sebastian could contact me. And did he? He did. But as it turned out, he practically had to stand in line. I am afraid I do not follow you. Well, first off, a very attractive young lady popped into my cab as I was leaving the airport for the hotel. I asked to share the cab. Oh? Two blocks later, she had the driver stop, planted a kiss on me, and jumped out. Indeed. You Americans seem to work fast, Herr Dollar. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't chalk up the incident to my personal charm, Inspector. She left her purse in the cab, and I gather the idea was to make somebody else think she'd pass the diamonds to me. And who would this somebody else be? A guy who jumped me in the lobby of the Polar Hotel. He was pretty convinced I had the stones. Mm. And how would the dead man Sebastian fit in? Well, it's my hunch. Sebastian was a member of the outfit who stole them in the first place. He could have been trying to play both ends against the middle. How do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, look, we know there were several members of the group... Okay, so they're bound to take a big loss when they fence the diamonds. They'd be lucky to get half the value, which would be 50000 True. Split three or four ways, that would cut the shares down considerably. But if Sebastian could engineer the return of the stones and collect a $25,000 reward for it, he'd be way ahead of the game. And Sebastian was secretly negotiating with you. Yeah, behind a newspaper in the hotel lobby. He wanted me to meet him in his room later so he could talk. I went there. I found him in the bathtub dead. And he had given you no specific information as to the location of the diamonds? Only this, Inspector. A picture postcard? Uh Uh-huh. The Kleibach Inn. He told me Kleibach was a small resort village up in the Alps. I know the place. Uh, The card is addressed to Sebastian and signed by F. Gruner. He said Gruner was a friend of his. Perhaps the diamonds are at the Kleibach Inn? He said no, that this card was only part of the key to finding them. And he gave you no indication as to what the rest of the key to their location was? No, no, none at all. I gather that's what we were going to talk about in his room later. But somebody else apparently had different ideas. Yeah. Say, look, you you said over the phone that Sebastian's killer could have been a woman. Well, he was struck on the head from behind, but only hard enough to stun him. His death was due to drowning in the bathtub. Many times in our experience, women have chosen such a method. The woman, then, could be Ilsa. Yeah. 
Or perhaps one of Sebastian's gang who learned of his plans. Very annoying, Herr Dollar. Many possibilities. But nothing tangible. Well, I'm heading for that place on the postcard, Inspector. The Kleibach Inn? Yeah. At this point, part of a key is better than none. Expense account item 7, $16.20 American. Transportation and incidentals to the Kleibach Inn. The postcard didn't do justice to the place. The village nestled in a little meadow below some towering peaks. Oh, above it was the inn, a chalet-type building that looked out over the valley. And it was a peaceful scene. A few cows in the meadow with jangling bells. A lot of snow on the peaks. A sky of startlingly clear blue and a few wisps of clouds nudging the peaks. Inside, the inn looked spacious and comfortable with a friendly fire crackling in the huge fireplace and a friendly-looking fellow behind the desk. Welcome to the Kleibach Inn. Well, thanks. Uh, please sign here. Okay. Thank you, Herr Dollar, is it? Yeah. You the manager? Yeah, I am Otto Friedrich, your host. Well, maybe you could help me, Otto. I am at your service. All right. Take a look at this postcard. Oh, what's the matter? That is not so good picture of the inn. I had some new ones made. You see, the lighting is wrong in this picture. The entire north wing is in the shadows. Now, in the good picture... Yeah, they... yeah. Well, what I want to know is, uh, do you sell these cards here? Not those cards, no. I have the new cards. See? Here is one. Now, see how much better... Well, how about in the village? Do they sell the old cards there? <sighs> yeah, I'm afraid so, in one or two shops. I have told them a hundred times I will give them the new ones if only yeah. they will. You see, it's... Yes, a... it's the lighting. You ever hear the name Sebastian around here? Sebastian. Sebastian, Sebastian. No need to memorize it. Just tell me if you've heard it, please. Is it a first name or a last name? There you've got me. Sebastian. No, I do not remember hearing that name. I'll be glad to check my register well, for how, uh, how about F. Gruner? He's the one who sent the car to Sebastian. Gruner. 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 Perhaps I heard the name in the village somewhere. Or I will see what I can find out. Okay, thanks. In the meantime, I hope you'll be comfortable here and enjoy your visit. Ski equipment is at your disposal. Thanks. But I'll enjoy my visit a lot more if I can find F. Gruner. Okay, okay, coming. Yeah? Oh, I say, I, I'm looking for a chap named Dollar who's supposed to be occupying this room. I'm Johnny Dollar. You? Are you certain? Reasonably, why? Oh, what a pity. Well, I'm sorry, old man, but there's not very much I can do about it. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. I, I, I say, you must forgive me. Must I? Well, I mean, well, you see, I used to know a chap in London named Dollar. Delightful fellow, really. Uh, incidentally, I'm Geoffrey Harris. We had ripping times together. How jolly for you. And when I heard that a chap named Dollar had registered here at the inn, well, naturally, I thought it must be old Bunny. Bunny? Yes, old Bunny Dollar. Oh, Bunny was just a dick nickname, you see. Well, that's reassuring, Harris. You know, there is a bit of a resemblance... You wouldn't mind a chance to be his brother or cousin, would you? No, no. Well, after all, Dollar's a bit of an odd name, and I thought... No, I'm sorry. To... If you'll excuse me, I'm on my way downstairs. Oh, splendid. Well, so am I. Oh? <laughs> it's quite a coincidence, is it? Is it? Well, running to you in this way, I mean, uh, you're absolutely sure that you, you don't know Bunny Dollar? This, I can guarantee. Oh, what a pity. He's really worlds of fun. Oh, yes, I can imagine. Well, what do you know? Uh, what's that? Hmm? Oh, uh, nothing. I, I just wanted an old friend over at the bar. Uh, see you later, Harris. Oh, I see. So I can see your point, old man. Well, hello, Ilsa. Uh, oh. It is Ilsa Schaefer, isn't it? Why, you're the yeah, one. that's right. Johnny Dollar, the one you shared a cab with back in Zurich. Yes, of course. What a coincidence. Isn't it? Incidentally, Johnny, I want to thank you for turning my purse in. It was foolish of me to leave it in your cab. Just an oversight, huh? Well, yes, of course. I mean, you didn't by any chance leave it in the cab on purpose, huh? Well, of course not. Why would I do a thing like that? Oh, maybe so somebody else would think you passed something along to me in that cab, besides a kiss. That kiss. I suppose I shouldn't have been so impulsive. Oh, I didn't object to that. But I did object to a muscle man jumping me and acting like you had given me something. Oh? 
What was I supposed to have given you? You don't have any idea? No. Honestly, I don't. Okay. We'll let that ride for the time being. Mind if I ask what you're doing here at the club again? Oh, this is a favorite spot of mine. I like to ski. Oh. You don't seem convinced. I really am quite a good skier, Johnny. Are you? As a matter of fact, I plan to go skiing in the morning. Would you like to come with me? Well, now, that might be pretty interesting. Uh, just a minute. I'll go check with Otto, see if I can borrow some skis. Be right back. All right, Johnny. Ah, Herr Dollar. And how are you enjoying your stay so far? Just fine, Otto, fine. Uh, look, about that girl over at the bar. Fräulein Schiefer. Oh, a most attractive young lady, no? A most attractive young lady, yes. Um, this seems to be a favorite spot of hers. I'm very happy to hear that, Herr Dollar. I suppose she comes here often, huh? This is her first visit to the Kleibach Inn. You're sure about that? Of course. I would certainly remember a young lady like her. Yes, this is her first visit, but I hope it will not be her last. Don't count on it, Otto. So Elsa was lying about coming here often. It could mean she'd lied about a few other things, too, like leaving her purse in my cab accidentally. She might have been trying to make it look like she'd passed the stolen diamonds onto me and thus take the heat off herself and whoever she was working with. I remembered what Inspector Honegger had told me, that Sebastian's killer could be a woman. I went back to the bar. Did you arrange for the skis? Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm all set. Good. Tomorrow morning, then. All right, where? Well, I had in mind the North Slope, but uh, perhaps you would not like that. Why not? Some people consider it too dangerous. Oh, I don't think I should worry about the danger, do you? Mm -hmm. After all, Elsa, I'll be in the best of hands. Thank you. I'm sure you'll take good care of me. I will certainly try to, Johnny. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, skiing's a strenuous sport, so is hunting. Put them together, and it's liable to kill you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Uh, an interesting structure to these first two episodes. It's kind of a reverse of what we typically see. The first episode is full of action, and then the second episode uh, has a lot more talking and setting up the stories 
uh, at the new location at the lodge. It's not bad, but it's just, like I said, a reverse from the structure we've seen with other serials. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we start with this email from Brad, who writes, Hi Adam, great podcast. I had an idea regarding the case of missing episodes, such as episode 2 of the Johnny Dollar Imperfect Alibi Matter. If the show script is available, I would believe it would be rather easy to apply AI and train a model to mimic the voices of the actors and have the AI model perform the script of the missing episode and then manually add sound effects. It would not be perfect, but with a short disclaimer before and after the episode indicated that it is an AI recreation based on the original script, it would allow these series to be fully heard as originally intended. This might be a good project for a summer intern or graduate student. Well, thank you for the email, Brad. Unfortunately, I don't have interns for any season or uh, grad students either. And I should clarify that the script is not easily publicly available. John Abbott gained access to the script when it was at the Thousand Oaks Public Library, and I believe that that entire collection was actually relocated to UCLA. But at the Thousand Oaks Library, Abbott was able to go in and read the script, and he had his notebook, and he summarized what happened in the script. I also uh, I don't think it's necessarily easy uh, it would be doable, I guess, to make a version of a story and have voices generated by AI read it and then do the sound effects as best you can. But I, I don't think the end product would be satisfactory. And this is, this is my opinion because this topic of recreating old-time radio programs with artificial intelligence. And I'll be honest about this, not judging anyone who feels differently, but I'm not a fan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is not a great program because of the general sound of Bob Bailey's voice or the general sound of Virginia Gregg's voice. It is a great program because of the decisions that they made as actors. Appearing in thousands upon thousands of old-time radio programs, they knew the art of audio drama. And in most cases, these performers knew each other. They knew each other's rhythms. And so they made decisions on how they were going to perform a particular line. And ultimately, the humanity of people like Bob Bailey in their performance is what made it great. Computer-generated, humanity-free, old-time radio recreations don't really have any appeal to me. And I couldn't imagine listening to 12 minutes or, you know, 25 minutes of of that, I don't think it would be a good experience. And if anything, I think it would cause people to appreciate the overall serial less. If you sat down and you listened to that and it was so far off, a poorly done AI recreation, I think, diminishes rather than adds to. My personal preference on this is that if we want to recreate old time radio, have human beings do it. There are already some really dedicated folks who love old-time radio and are actors, and they perform it. And I've talked about uh, some of these on uh, another podcast, uh, an episode of Dragnet. Uh, People like the Gotham Radio Players, uh, the folks who make uh, the hot copy radio theater. Personally, I would rather hear a script performed by an actor making decisions, putting humanity and their own experience and making their own choices to put together a good performance than listen to a computer taking the voice of deceased actors and being a script. I think that actually this sort of thing has been done. What I kind of think of is some of the work of Big Finish, the British audio drama company. 
Now, the first season of The Avengers, not to be confused with the superheroes, but the British uh, series that really blew up in popularity in its fourth season with Diana Rigg as Mrs. Peel. But it had a first three seasons, the second and third season with Kathy Gale. First season was really a lot different. The series still starred Patrick McNee, but it was a much more serious program where he was teaming up with Dr. David Keel, played by Ian Hendry. The vast majority, more than 90% of the first season of The Avengers, was missing at the time that Big Finish got the license. And what Big Finish did is they went ahead and they recast the roles of John Steed and David Keel, and they had new actors perform faithful adaptations of the entire first season of the Avengers. And it is just fantastic. Very authentic, well produced, very well made, and you get great performances because you have actual actors performing, working, playing off one another. It certainly sounds a heck of a lot better than if you just said, let's, you know, uh, get some recordings of voices and, and try to make something that sounds like the actors who played it in the 1960s. And they also did something which I was very reluctant about with Doctor Who, which is their main license. They decided they wanted to make full cast audio dramas featuring the third Doctor, who was played by John Pertwee, who passed in 1996. And they actually recast the role. And my first reaction is, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to buy this. But then I rethought based on the fact that I appreciated that Big Finish had a lot of respect for each of the performers who played that role and that if they did that they would do it respectfully. They would put out something that was actually going to be entertaining. And I gave them a chance, and they proved me right. And they proved me right on a couple of things like that, where they were doing those sort of recastings. Never did it in a way that was disrespectful or felt cheap. It was done with love and affection for the era, and it was done in a way that produced a high-quality product. And to me, I guess that's where I come back to with old-time radio. I would need... Anything that I would be promoting or supporting to be respectful of the work that the actors did and to be actually high quality. I mean, the Bob Bailey, Johnny Dollar serials, in my mind, are the greatest body of audio drama, certainly on a series in the history of old time radio. That's where I value them. So do I want to throw in some sloppy AI recreation that takes Bob Bailey's voice? Be like having AI finish Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. And I guess that gets to the whole idea of respect. Because I think that during the golden age of radio, stars were not often respected, particularly those who were radio actors first. When you listen to stories, there are tales of actors just being told, you're being replaced, you know, because, with no notice and no real acknowledgement on the air of what they did, or even a public thank you for the time you spent on the program. And in many ways, only ever received appreciation for the work they did through the rise of old-time radio fans in the 1970s. And I fear that using AI reduces these remarkably talented men and women who hone their craft through all of these performances to voice boxes that produce perfectly replaceable sound patterns that a computer can imitate. 
And I just can't buy into that. I could change my mind, just like I changed my mind about the third Doctor adventures. But for me to do that, I would have to feel in some way that the effort was respectful of the original actors. Now, again, if we're talking human recreations, that's another story. I have no problem whatsoever with that. Nobody says only Shakespeare can perform Hamlet. But I think it's a different thing when you're taking an actor's voice and putting it in a computer and expecting that to be the same thing or clo close enough to an actual performance. And I get that other people feel differently about it. I, I do think there's also some overestimation of what AI can do anyway. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone who feels differently, but this is how I feel about it. And this may be an issue where I don't address it again. This is the second time I've talked about it. And unless my opinion changes, I don't think I need to talk about it again. I, I think this may be something I go ahead and I take that portion of the commentary and just make it a separate thing that I can include on my FAQ. And to quote Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. And then I did have a couple of quick uh, comments I wanted to acknowledge from YouTube. Uh, one listener wrote, love the intros, and another said, you have an interesting voice. Well, thank you, Nust, for you to say so. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Rob. Rob's been one of our Patreon supporters since December, currently supporting the podcast at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Rob. And that will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure and rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial, but join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Hard seems to be okay. Look, what's this all about? I am investigating the Misuko case. I guess you've heard about it. Who hasn't heard about it? And you know that one of the men who picked up Mitsuko is dressed in the uniform of an American officer? So? So, don't get sore if I ask you a few questions. You live here alone? Yeah, sure. Pretty big house for just one guy, isn't it? I suppose. I just didn't bother to move after the family left. Family? Wife and kids, they went back to the States a month ago. I'm due to go back myself in a couple of weeks. You got a picture of them handy? Yeah, in the wallet there. Help yourself, pal. Hey. Okay, wise guy, on your feet. Uh, looks like I sort of let myself wide open for that one, huh, Lieutenant? Yeah, you sure did. And you're wide open for a couple of slugs from this gun if you try anything smart. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.